Well, welcome, and thank you all for being here. My name is Nathan Lewis, and I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs at the Montserrat College of Art. Just to know that this conversation is being recorded, so please turn off your camera if you don't feel comfortable. So you also know the structure of the evening. Uh, M is going to talk about his path and ideation, and at the end, there will be time for some questions. Additionally, I want to use this moment to announce that M is continuing his work with our college and is included in an upcoming screen art series entitled Still Here. As part of this, M is going to be premiering his film Deathlessness during a time virtual event on uh, November 17th. But it's my extreme pleasure to introduce M. Lamar. He's a composer, theorist, artist, performer, and designer. His work evokes otherworldly lamentations, celebration, historic truth, rememories, cries of agony, ecstasy, invocation, and admonishment. He has shown and performed across the globe from the cloisters at the Met, Funk House in Berlin, MoMA PS1, and beyond. M. Lamar's work is both a mirror of and a window to the tragedy and the horror that is us. And with that said, please join me in welcoming M. Lamar. Hi. Thank you for having me uh, here, Nathan. We, so because I'm showing deathlessness, um, I want to say that I wrote that sort of, um, it encapsulates in many ways um, what I need to do in my work in general. What of the angel's dead? The debt the angel owes for its deathlessness. Anthony Paul Farley. I am not a man, you see. I am an angel. Sun Ra. This waking world has nothing for me. This time has nothing. It is within the dreamlike state of singing that Negro Gothic cinema exists. This state is holy, a holy work of theater, not within the realm of the living, nor the living realm of the dead. The theater of Negro Gothic cinema exists, exits, and occurs in the singing deep of the deathlessness of the dreaming dead. Negro Gothic cinema is an embodied philosophy of performance and an artifact, as well as an incantation of a theater of disembodiment. The holy theater of Negro is certain that the presentation and the continuum of the spirit it is primarily concerned with the continuum and the presentation of the spirit what Sun Ra called spirit sound. The spirit is the work, worker, and working of the Negro Gothic, disappearing the performer's body, rotting, decaying, temporally jailed, brings his being into being, this disappearance, I mean. Transcendent black beings becoming pure light and energy. Negro Gothic cinema is looking for a way out of the body and of time. The theater that constitutes it is and calls for its birth, it suspends time, both because it aims to connect with the infinite and because it rejects the pornographic presentation of black flesh. The theater of Negro Gothic cinema is deeply concerned with the dead and believes in their actual deathlessness. Those of African descent transfigure through sound, mourning, loss, and ancestral remembering. The Negro Gothic body has to forever disappear as an actual survival strategy. The Negro Gothic creator con conceives of live sound uh, as received in complete darkness. 
or as a soundtrack to carefully edited uh, short cinema. This creator is primarily interested in the production of sound with the transformative aspect of sound in the grandest of the Black radical tradition. Negro Gothic cinema is a practice of theater that is theater of actual emergency, transmorphication, and the rebirth of the unborn. Raising spirit, Cornel West reminds us, music at its best is the grand archeology span into the transfiguration of our guttural cry. The great human effort to grasp in time our deepest passions and yearnings as prisoners of time. Profound music leads us beyond language to the dark roots of our scream and the celestial heights of our silence. I love that. I absolutely love that. The theater of Negro Gothic cinema exists in space as tragic tear without remedy. It is grieving and the impossibility of life outside of mourning. It is embodiment. The question of embodiment in Negro Gothic performance is in fact the question of disembodiment. How does one perform as a ghost? The theater of Negro Gothic cinema is unable to summon ecstasy, joy, um, and a static frenzy present in the gospel performances of Marion Williams or Mahalia Jackson. The grief is too overwhelming. However, Jackson singing, soon I will be done with the troubles of the world at the end of the film, Imitation of Life, as well as Marian Anderson singing, when I am laid in earth. These are the heights of Negro Gothic cinema. The theater of Negro Gothic cinema rejects the pornographic presentation of black flesh as well as presentation of black blackness as spectacle. Indeed, the Negro Gothic obliterates representational naturalism and liberal humanism in the grandest of the radical black tradition. Church singing where the voice leaps into and through you, commingling with the living, the dead, the breath, the spirit. Negro Gothic theater depends on singing that uncaptures the black male countertenor and unties him from the castrati. In the 18th century, boys were castrated to preserve their alto and soprano voices from changing during puberty. The black male countertenor singing the lynching song cycle evokes the castrated black male with uh, first with the first sound made. It forever evokes and speaks to an absence. The Negro Gothic is about absence. It would seem that radical black cultural production should embrace an ethos other than capture, containment, and capitalization. Under whatever other ethos that is film, the camera, projected images, the performing body on stage as radical black culture, as a radical black cultural problem, excuse me. How does one make performance cinema that is not, was not, and cannot be captured? In the, six, in the 1981 film, Diva, the opera singer uh, never consents to a proper recording of her voice. She wanted her voice to exist in the rooms in which she sang. This is a portrait that must always disappear. It must never be fixed or captured. Like unrecorded sound, uncaptured cinema, the unseen performer must somehow be put forward and released into the atmosphere to simply do what it can in the moment 
and our memory, singing in the dark, singing without a body, singing from an erased, invisible place in the universe. How does one film a ghost of an angel? And that's not the whole essay, but I think I'll stop there. I love that. How does one film a ghost of an angel? I think we should just talk now. Um, is that all right, Nathan? You, uh, no, I, I didn't, in our sort of conversation about this, I think that I said something about providing sort of biographical details or something like that, but we can talk about that if you have questions about that. I really, um, I really love that piece of text. Um, I feel as if I, it's not um, narcissistic of me to say so because I, I, I don't feel as if I, I have complete responsibility for it because um, my collaborator Tucker Culbertson um, assisted me in the writing of that text. So um, we, we sort of, I sent him sort of a bunch of stuff and then he sort of like started um, copy editing and editing and then sort of rewriting things and then I got it back and I was like well why did you do that and then so we sort of there was this back and forth we um Tucker and I have collaborated on stagings of my work we've collaborated on um librettos uh funeral doom spiritual is uh comes to mind Negro antichrist uh, you know, um so he's a he's a person who knows my work very well He's very uh, in tune with what I'm attempting to do in the world. I think every artist, every maker should have at least one person, maybe a few if you're lucky, um, that really sort of understands what you're trying to do uh, with your work and uh, can assist you um, in kind of helping to bring to life what you do. I mean, I think other eyes, other ears um, are really crucial. I, I have a voice teacher on a kind of ear. Um, do you have questions, Nathan, for me? Absolutely. And again, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. But a little bit later on, we will open it up to everyone. Um, I do want to know so much about you and about your work. I think we are interested in your past, present, and future. But I'm also interested in, in the spirit in the bones, in the blood of everything that you were discussing. I think, you know, some of our earlier conversations have just been so exciting because whenever I try to describe your work to people, um, the adjectives that I'm using to describe your work are the adjectives of terrible histories, are the adjectives of S&M, are the adjectives of, of beauty and sadness. And it's all kind of like these very interesting weighted words and weighted things. I mean, even this notion of bondage, like what this, this means. And I am really curious about your aesthetic ideation in terms of your narrative building. I think, I hope everyone has gotten a chance to look at so many of his incredible videos and performances on YouTube and Vimeo. Um, talk about the direction in terms of your historic reference and um, this kind of Rememory, this retelling of an event in terms of not something that has been forgotten, but something that has not been remembered. Um, and I think there's a, a really interesting um, in there. Yeah, well, wait, it's the moment, I think that the one of the most crucial moments in my art making, and I didn't know it at the time um, when I was in college. Um, they, there was a screening, I, I went to the San Francisco Art Institute and in some class I was in something about film or something, maybe film history, I, I don't really remember. There was a screening of Looking for Langston uh, by Isaac Julian and I actually referred to that film later on in, in the essay that I was just reading. Um, that film along with um, Toni Morrison's Beloved on the blue side, but particularly Beloved in, in her sort of like way of looking back, like, like to me I was like, oh well this is the way you make art. Like the way you make art is that you are in your current moment, but you're looking constantly at history. You're looking constantly at the past and trying to sort of figure yourself out, figure out where you fit into a particular kind of past. And, and one of the things that's notable about looking for Langston, because he, he, he does this, there's a moment, you know, most of it is in the Harlem Renaissance, trying to sort of explore the mysterious homosexuality of Langston Hughes because it wasn't like sort of an open, it was an open secret, uh, but it wasn't really talked about within the sort of respectable bourgeois, uh, black kind of canonization that was happening at the time with Langston Hughes. And so that was this sort of moment where you got 
to have this really kind of transgressive cinema that would sort of look in the shadows and in the, and it was a 16 millimeter film too, wonderfully beautiful film. You can look in the shadows and in the light for these kinds of questions of, de of death and desire. And so we're in the Harlem Renaissance, but then there's this moment when you sort of have sort of later in the film, all this house music, and then you're sort of in a, a, a black gay club. Uh, and I thought, this is, this is the thing. Actually, and um, Derek Jarman's films, uh, like I'm thinking of Edward II, when he was um, sort of, you know, like it was definitely a period piece, but then people were sort of running around in the film with like Walkman. Um, this is an 80s, I can't remember what the year, an 80s Derek Jarman film. So I thought this is the way one makes work. Uh, one is grounded in a history, uh, one is sort of trying to sort of excavate a kind of history, and then one is inserting oneself in this current moment in time. Also, Kathy Acker, I think very much was, she was um, at the Art Institute at the time I was there. Did, you know, the, the writer, did, uh, Kathy Acker, uh, I took a class with her and she's, I would say also a big influence in the way that she was very interested in rewriting text. Like she was, you know, I think even, um, had pleasurism, pleasure, she pleasurized, you know, technically or something, other people's texts. She was very interested in like, in, in what this sort of meta narrative was, in, in particularly relative to men and where she fit into that kind of narrative. So to me, that is just sort of like how one makes work. And so when I started, uh, when I dropped out of art school and sort of started being in rock bands, uh, one of the first songs I wrote was a song called Plantation Mistress. Um, and it's sort of like a horror film thing. It's sort of a B-movie horror film sort of narrative um, about grave robbing negresses, you know, sort of holding the heads of these plantation mistresses. Um, so it sort of had this like B-movie kind of horror aesthetic, uh, but it was also historical. Uh, and this was, I don't know what, in the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, we were, I had a band called Guillotine. That was my first sort of rock band outside of when I dropped out of Yale, <laughs> I laughed because it sounds ridiculous. But um, but yeah, I basically dropped out of Yale because I, I wanted to sort of focus on music and performance exclusively, and not sort of being a part of the art world. Even though I guess now I'm some kind of peripheral part of the art world. Like uh, I do things, like that. but that need to sort of make music and and then sort of focusing on horror. I, I was interest, interested at the time in the, the Misfits and, you know, all the, this song called Horror Hotel, Horror Hotel. Um, and I, 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 I mean, these sort of punk bands, but then sort of inserting race into the whole thing. Like I was sort of like, what's more horrific than like, you know, white supremacy and plantations? And, you know, my favorite film is Solo. And I was like, you know, well, what if Solo um, was a plantation, you know, is always my sort of question. So that's been kind of this thing that's been unfolding in my work, a lot of my work for a long time. Like the, the what if Solo was a plantation in terms of, particularly in the video work that I make, maybe the librettos are kind of coming from a different place. I, I, I especially lately, I see them very much as, um, as kind of sacred text, as, um, as holy, um, holy sound or holy theater. Uh, in that sense. Uh, so I'm kind of always blending, but I don't think those things don't, I think that horror and even like sort of like really graphic sexuality doesn't exist outside of the spirit. Uh, and so I'm always trying to sort of negotiate. Uh, I guess like Prince, Prince was very, uh, I mean, my work is nothing like Prince, but I mean, we understand in a popular sphere, everyone probably has heard of him. And we understand that there was this sort of pull in his work always between the sacred and the profane, like this sort of like God impulse and this very bodily um, kind of impulse. I mean, in, in, but in my work, there's a, I mean, I'm definitely purely invested in the spirit. Uh, the body is, um, you know, I'm kind of a, in a, this just a, this a vowel of the body right now. Um, it just seems so limited and limiting. Uh, I'm very interested in, in the spirit almost exclusively. And I'm very interested in Sun Ra right now, almost, well, not exclusively, but, um, but yeah, I think that there's, there's a commingling of this kind of history. You know, Sun Ra was also an historian, an intellectual, uh, an neurologist. He was, uh, knew all this stuff about uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics that were very much a part of the kind of his philosophy of making music. Um, so I'm very interested in where that commingles with this kind of horror historical stuff. Um,
actually the the conversation I've been having this week is about a performance that I'm doing at um, the Manhattan School of Music um, next year, 2021. Uh, and it's going to be a, a radical restaging of the Requiem that I wrote and premiered at Cathedral of St. John the Divine in 2012. It's called Speculum Orum, Shackled to the Dead. And this, in, this piece happens entirely on a slave ship. So you're, you're just, you know, sung from the point of view of someone in the bowels, the belly of the, the slave ship. Um, so there's no sort of escape, there's no hope really. Um, but what I'm imagining now is a setting or staging that would um, make the slave ship into a spaceship. So I'm trying to kind of like um, marry Sun Ra's kind of outer space thing with even George Clinton's kind of mothership idea with the slave ship. I mean, and then what if, um, in fact, the people sort of coming from outer space are coming to sort of deliver people from this slave ship, this, from this transatlantic situation into some celestial space. Um, it's kind of, I mean, so I think that I, it's a really fun place to be in a way where I'm trying to reimagine ways to stage my work where you're not just captured on that ship. Um, I mean, it's a very, it's a very difficult piece to sing in that sense because you have to be in those circumstances, you know? Um, I guess now I want a way out of those circumstances, you know, it, within that piece. And I do, I do the black artists who've been, Erica Badu to some extent, um, have been sort of like grappling with this slave ship mothership question. Um, so I, yeah, I'm interested to see how that, that works out. And, and it's also going to be a, a some kind of a virtual performance too. So we can do a lot with green screens and um, sort of things. But yeah, I'm excited to see how that, how that works out. Um, I like the I idea what you're... Of, the, of the virtual with the, um, you, know, you talk about this dissolution of the body and the spirit kind of spirit writ large. Um, and now that all of this, you know, the, just beyond kind of the COVID, but just everything happening in this past uh, seven, eight months, and where this major, major, major transition is happening um, across the world, every single thing about how we're living our lives, how we're having our relationships, how we're expressing ourselves articulately, or, or, you know, articulating ourselves, is kind of going outside of the body. Um, and that's really fascinating to imagine that you're taking these narratives quite literally off this planet. Um, that that is literally ground uncharted. That's so interesting. I mean, I think I'm not the first, though. I th I do think that um, you hear in the sounds of Sun Ra this kind of trying trying to sort of reconcile this state, um, this American state of you know at the time when he was born, Sun Ra. We're talking about Jim Crow. We're talking about lynching. Uh, he. Um, interestingly enough, was uh, drafted into the Korean War and was like, I'm absolutely not going. Uh, and so then he was arrested and put on trial. And he insisted that if he were made to serve in um, the army and, and to fight this war, that he would take the weapons given to him and turn them on the most senior officer uh, within um, his, that army. And so I was, I, 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 I'm so endlessly, inspired by that kind of energy, that defiant energy. Um, I mean, Sun Ra wasn't, I mean, if you know what Sun Ra looked like and what he would dress like, it wasn't a theatrical performance. You know, he would go to the grocery store as Sun Ra. He would, he would, um, I mean, I think that when he, the, the quote that I started with, I am not a man you see, I am an angel. I mean, he literally, I think, believed that, and I believe it, uh, in the case of Sun Ra, uh, that he's literally an angel, this person, and, and he insisted that there were always these people, these angelic figures who walk among us, but are not really ever there. You know, if you're from the Black church, or maybe any church experience, there's this thing of being in the world, but not of the world. Uh, one of my favorite singers, Jesse Norman, always talks about, like, you know, she again grew up in a Jim Crow South, so Southern situation. She said, well, you know, I, I knew that these things were happening around me, but they didn't define me, that these things were not um, what I was about. Uh, and this transcendent spirit 
right? I mean, that when you think, look at someone like Marian Anderson, these opera singers, I, I'm particularly interested in opera singers, um, existing very much usually in, in very European literature, but then with these very black sounds, in the case of Marian Anderson, Paul Robeson, Leontine Price, Jesse Norman, um, so, you know, many black opera singers today, ex in this very European tradition, Italy, Germany, France, um, colonial histories, but with this kind of very independent spirit, this spirit that wouldn't be contained nationally uh, or just be limited to whatever the American music is um, that our people created, uh, but that would transcend time and space. I guess I'm, I've always been invested in transcendence, the idea that um, one can be very aware of in dealing with whatever horrible circumstances you're in but that those circumstances don't define you and that they, that, that they can't sort of stop your whatever your light is um in the, the words of the old negro spiritual this little light of mine i'm gonna let it shine um that even w whatever circumstances are sort of happening that one can find a way to um you know sort of live whatever their calling is whatever that might be um and it, all of our callings are in service to someone, ultimately, uh, some other being, other people. Um, and so, yeah, the work is, is always trying to sort of, yeah, deal with these questions of spirit. Um, yeah, uh, it's an interesting time. I, I just performed for the first time, really. I, have, I, I don't count this other thing that I did a few months ago. The, the, this was um, a live stream thing that happened to Bowery Electric on Tuesday night. And it was just so fantastic to be back in the preparation. Cause I mean, I've been practicing every day. I practice every day, it's just what I do. But practicing sort of with a goal in mind of, of presentation is very different. And I was so just filled with joy uh, in, in the preparation for the performance. There's a thing about working on what you work on. I mean, I, any artist can relate to this, working on this thing that feels so important to you and you want to present it as best you can. You're, so you're, you're working very hard to be at your very best, whatever, you're, whatever that is at the, at the time and in the moment. Uh, and, it's just, and it's an exciting thing. I, Serena Williams always talks about, um, I feel like I'm jumping around all over the place now, but Serena Williams always talks about being at her very best, you know, but, but doing your best on that day. Um, performing is, is that, um, when you're performing music and trying to sort of sing the way that I'm trying to sing. Uh, it's a lot of work and it's fantastic work, it's exciting, it's exhilarating. I mean, to breathe, to inhale that much air, to exhale that much air in preparation and then ultimately in the performance is such a glorious thing. It's just this deep meditation that you're engaging in, like this intense like inhalation and then exhalation, inhalation, exhalation that you're doing um, in the course of, of course, preparing the influence when you're hopefully connected uh, deeply to what you're singing about the histories about which you're singing. Hopefully, um, something really special can happen. Hopefully, it doesn't always happen, but um, but really, I was just thrilled. I mean, I guess I was taking for granted the fact that I could, you know, sort of fly wherever I'd be flying to do another show, you know, and then suddenly it just stopped. Uh, and I was like, why well, am not performing? I mean, it's a really, for those who um, do this, it's a real identity crisis, uh, I think. I mean, who am I if I'm not sort of in this preparation? I mean, and I'm still in the preparation, but not with, before this show on Tuesday, I was sort of so, so unclear as to whether it would have an outlet or not. And recording is not the same thing, making an album or a, it's not the same thing as, as being in a room, you know, sonically with people. Ideally, of course, these live streams happen, but with people receiving the sound that you're making. It's a very different experience. Um, certain kinds of sounds, sonic sounds, like acoustic instruments, like a piano, a violin, a voice, uh, even if they're amplified, in a room, being in a room with them is a very different sonic experience than, you know, this, what we're doing now. Um, we do our best. I think that the, the people at Bowery Lecture were very good. The sound people were very good. And we, we I think, presented very good sound. Um, it's just, but it's just not the same. I mean, there's not the same being in a room when sound is being produced. This is what I think um, 
troubles me so much about like the, a lot of the corporate hip hop that I see. It's uh, and I'm really on a tangent now. Maybe you should pull me back. But the corporate hip hop that I see when they're lip syncing, I mean when they're rapping and they're lip syncing, that just I don't understand in a way. Uh, I mean, I, I do understand because it's business. It's not like art. It's not trying to sort of give a transcendent experience. It's doing a business and the business that sort of the audience expects to hear the recording or something that's very similar to the recording. And so that's the business of the thing. Um, but it's so disappointing to me because I'm looking for an actual experience, you know, I'm looking to sort of be reassured in the thing that I've consumed as a... You know, that really does bring up... Um, kind of the, the role of you as, as both creator and experiencer of your own art. Um, you, I, I'm so curious to, to learn how you're making these compositions and these choices for how you're singing, because yes, it's obvious, of course you're a performance artist, but you're also a, um, a contortionist with your, with your literal voice. You're doing things that people can't do. Um, and I'm wondering how, when you're composing uh, your pieces, are you considering the physical strain on your body to make this happen? Or are you just phys considering the sound that it makes? Or are you kind of thinking of that holistic thing of me performing this is as much the piece as us listening to it? When I'm, so usually these pieces start with text, like a libretto. And when I'm writing, librettos I'm not really thinking about performing them in the moment I'm just I mean I think that one of the things that happens is a lot of research before a piece Speculum more for example there's a lot of reading about the middle passage a lot of reading about account, all kinds of accounts that I could find of what would go on on slave ships um, the speculum orm specifically is a device used on slave ships to force open the mouths of these captured Africans, um, so-called slaves, to force them to eat. Many of them decided that they were being taken away to be eaten by cannibals, and they thought, well, if I don't eat, I won't sort of continue to live. I also won't defecate on myself if I don't eat or if I don't drink. Um, and so then the speculum oral was used to force open their mouths because, you know, of course they're a commodity at this point. They're, they're this investment these Europeans have made and they want a return on their investment. It's capital. Uh, human beings is capital. And so um, before I started writing the piece, there was a lot of reading, there was a lot of research. And then when I sort of went to write things, for example, this thing, this always sort of, um, surprises me and, and leaves me in wonder this I not this this image there was an etching of of a black woman sort of hung upside down um from one of her legs this etching that was in a book and I kind of didn't spend a lot of time with the etching as I was reading um this history and um and, but as I'm writing the thing this thing they hung her on the deck came up and I just sort of started writing it. And then I, then later I remembered that I'd seen this image when I was doing the research. So I think that um, there's a lot of work that comes through that, that goes in and then you sort of just try to begin to write within the circumstance. When you're sort of writing, you just sort of try to put yourself in the place, uh, in the story. It's essentially a story you know, or a narrative. And so always surprised also that trying to leave my body is a song from speculum orb shackles to the dead and i was surprised when that came out again i i mean i was that particularly comes from this moment in beloved when when all of the punctuation goes away in the novel and you're on a slave ship and one of the lines that terry morrison writes is they are trying to leave their bodies um and the, 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 those who eat nasty themselves, um, again, this whole thing about not eating, serving oneself towards death, towards not um, producing waste. Of course, you, they would have to live in their waste. Uh, they would be shackled to uh, other people who are dead. Um, one of the really powerful images from Beloved, I remember from that section is, um, he looked at me with dead eyes, you know, when the, the, this, per, this one person who was shackled to another person who was dead. Um, being just sort of being in that circumstance, you know, sort of writing, trying to write that um, and to sing that. So when I'm, when I'm writing the initial text, I'm not really thinking about singing it. And then it's set to music. And then I sort of just, you know, 
try to make it happen. Um, the way that I sing, like I think that like whenever I, um, I don't know if Karen Finley, I was talking to Karen Finley's class recently. I think she was gonna come be part of this. Hi Karen, if you're out there. Um, I was talking to her class at NYU and, and this wonderful black student sort of raised his hand and was like, who do you perceive, who do you see as the audience for your work? And um, I got this question, usually from black people, because um, I think that they're very confused. Like, because, you know, I think that the way that I sing and the, my obsession with kind of operatic singing, I think confuses a lot of people because it's not an immediate kind of way to communicate whatever my ideas are, you know? But um, for me, the form is as important as the content. Uh, and that me singing through these pieces in, in this way that I sing requires more air. Um, it's so there's a greater kind of inhalation, there's a greater um, kind of expansion of the diaphragm. More, more, the thing about operatic singing is that it requires so much physically to produce the sound. Um, and lately I've been thinking, why wouldn't you try to sort of find the, the most powerful way to present a voice? And it is the most powerful way to present a voice in terms of to cultivate a voice, you know, in popular singing, you know, the, there's the, the microphones and it's very close and you can whisper and all these things, which and I do some of that. I use microphones, of course, obviously, but why wouldn't you want to have the kind of um, training and apparatus that could create the most power um, to optimize it? Like, like it's one of those, like Arthur Mitchell, the, the great uh, ballet dancer who started the, um, the uh, Harlem School, what is it? Um, the Harlem uh, Dance Theater of Harlem, God, uh, brain fart, then uh, Arthur Mitchell, but he always talked about, he's like, if you want to break dance, if you want to be a stripper, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. This classical technique will give you a foundation for doing any of those things. And, and why wouldn't you want to have the most kind of like facility at your disposal when you're trying to, um, I mean, in this case, communicate with, with the spirits, you know, to communicate with and to sort of channel a lot of, a lot of this energy, this, this, the energy of the dead. Why, I, it's a very serious thing, you know, like it, to try to do that. And so why wouldn't you want to have the most uh, at your disposal in terms of um, a power of a, of a flexibility of a, um, of command. So that's a lot of it. I mean, I, I think that it's a sound that alienates maybe a lot of people and they don't understand it, which is fine. Um, I mean, I'm very lucky that um, I don't uh, long to be understood. I think that's a, a grand privilege uh, that I have, that, um, that I, I'm not going to be here for very long, you know, on this planet. So um, I'm, I'm very lucky that um, I continue to be inspired uh, to make new work and to perform work that I've already made. I continue to desire to do that. And that in and of itself is a gift, a grand gift. And if I've always said that if there are like two people in the room and actually there have been, like, this is one tour that I was doing in Europe where I had this really grand festival. Like it was like lots and lots and lots of people that I was playing in, um, in the, the, yeah, in the UK. But then I sort of like wanted to go off and do sort of like a more DIY show in Glasgow. And uh, so I went to Glasgow and I've been to Glasgow many times and just lots of, like a fantastic audience live, made lots of money, you know, and it, I only say that to say that it helps you on tour to make money, making money when you're traveling from city to city. Um, and so there were, there were literally three people in the room and I, and I said to myself, I'm going to play the best show I have ever played in my entire life. And um, it, was, it, it went very well, the performance. Um, I was very serious about that. So I um, really find it, a very lucky thing that I um, just am compelled to do what I do. Like I, it's a very, so I'm just doing it um, as best I can, however I can. I mean, and in between, like you read this lovely list of places I've performed, all these like sort of grand art institutions, but one of the things that was a huge part of my life before this, um, this plague <laughs> stopped everything, were a lot of DIY shows in, in DIY venues, um, basements, like sort of weird storefronts and legal um, places where, you know, sort of punk kids, or weird sort of people outside of, you know, society or whatever, sort of have these spaces to make art, music, whatever. Huge part of like what I do um, 
or what I used to do before all this. So, so in between, you know, playing at PS1 or whatever, uh, or the Cloisters or whatever, um, I'd be doing a lot of these basement shows and a lot of like, and I would maybe play with metal bands, noise bands, goth bands. Um, I love all that. I love feeling connected to a scene outside of, you know, I think that was why I ended up dropping out of Yale, actually. I, I, I was too institutionalized within a kind of mainstream art world thing. Like I needed to hang out with, you know, the degenerate types, you know. Um, those are really my people. Um, I mean, one of my dearest, dearest, dearest friends back when I was living in San Francisco, was a drug addict. <laughs> you know, when I watched them, I'm, I don't know if you're watching, hi, I'm not gonna say your name, but watched her shoot up many, many times. Um, I'd never, I've never done heroin, that particular drug, but, and I don't say that to glamorize it at all, but I just mean to say that um, whatever these people that were, are my dear, dear, dear friends are going through in their lives, that, those are the people that I need to be with. Those are the people that were, um, that have grounded me and, and sort of remind me of who I am. Uh, and it's not, I've never been a bourgeois black person, you know, like I've never aspired to be a bourgeois black person. I've only aspired to be, well, to be fully myself, but it's, it's something outside of, of conventional um, everything really. Um, I always think that um, even though I'm sort of doing all of this work about race, I can never be held up to some sort of, um, sort of uh, some kind of identity politics sort of emblem of anything, you know, a symbol of something, you know, because I don't really represent, you know, like black gayness in any way that any other black gay person would probably <laughs> want to claim. <laughs> and I don't represent, I don't know, I, I, I even I don't think I represent gothness, even though I, I feel very identified with goth. I don't think I sort of represent it in a way that many white goths would um, want to claim me. There's maybe some, uh, you can speak to that as a white goth, Nathan, but um, some, sure, but I think many are sort of find it confusing, like maybe because I don't sound like, you know, 80s, like Bauhaus or something, <laughs> like maybe it's not, or I don't sound like Roz Williams and there's no, like that kind of like beat or something. I idolize Roz Williams, I mean, I, I anyway. Um, so I, I digress. I said to myself, because uh, Kimbra the other night interviewed me after my performance, uh, Valerie Electric, Kimbra Fowler, you know, Beloved's Horror of Karen Black. I love Kimbra. Hi, Kimbra, if you're watching. I, I watched the interview back and I said, I'm terrible at this. I never complete a thought. Uh, I'm sort of going on to the next thought before I complete that thought. I need to slow down. Bell Hooks, the wonderful feminist writer who is one of my idols, and, and I, I consider her a mentor, even though we only met recently, but just through her, all those fabulous books. Uh, at least around feminism and capitalism and, and patriarchy and black masculinity. But she said, you need to slow down. You need to slow down and speak more. You are, and I thought, oh, that's really sweet. Do you think I'm smart? And when I was watching myself the other night, I thought, you need to slow down. Like you don't allow yourself to complete a thought before you move to the other thought. And I worry that I've done that again here tonight. So I apologize if I- am Not, not at all. I mean this is truly a piece in itself. And, you know, with, uh, with about 10 or so minutes left, I, of course, I have way too many questions. I have all my sticky notes here for you. Um, but also, I'd love for an opportunity. You know, we're thankful that people, a lot of names they don't recognize, I think, from all over the, the country, if not world right now. Um, does anyone want to pop in and ask a question? Or it looks like Jules does. And I will unmute you. All right. Do I know Jules? Hello. Jules. Hello. 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 Oh, we hear echo. I think we hear you echoing, Jules. I think I heard. I think I heard Jules. I don't, we don't see Jules, but I heard Jules. Hello. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Oh, it's bad. So can you, you can't me? see me. So that's what's going to happen there. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Hi, Jules. Hi, how are you doing today? Um, I guess my question kind of ties into the earlier kind of um, recitation you made, and it's maybe me getting blinders on and certain phrases and kind of um, concept you expressed there. But um, 
I guess my question is essentially um, one of the phrases that stood out was kind of like the, the, the Negro Gothic cinema standing contention against the kind of liberal individualism of art. I guess the question I have though is as a performer, as such a kind of singular personality in your performance and your music and your singing, do you find that as a point of contention or does you find that something you were working against or working behind, you know, in your own practice and your own art? Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm quite following you. You're saying something about, because I think that the line was, um, it's uh, the Negro Gothic is uh, against um, liberal humanism. Um, yes, liberal, yeah, hum liberal humanism, so, exactly, yes, yeah. I mean, I think that one, when we have, um, I read a lot of stuff about class, you know, like I'm, I'm a person who's very anti-capital, I'm very much um, a redistribution of wealth person, um, I'm very much, a, I was even, like, my boyfriend didn't know about Hakeem Bey's work, and if you know Hakeem Bey, but um, uh, Temporary Autonomous Zone, or I love those books. Um, this sort of, he's an anarchist, essentially. And I'm not an anarchist, but I'm somewhere in some sort of socialist sort of mindset of, um, of all this sort of, and so I think, so my point in bringing up all of this capitalist stuff is I think that there's a way in which um, sort of people who are outside of whatever the dominant thing is, if you're queer or black or, or goth or, or metal or whatever the whatever your identification might be um if you're outside of 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 a sort of status quo identity there there's this kind of move towards an incorporation within the status quo of all of these various identities and i mean i can't i mean like gay people were trying to get married for a long time and they finally did and i can't you know good for them you know for wanting that and i don't you know i would never want to deny anyone whatever kind of participation they would like to have in the status quo and in the, the world is uh, participating in that. But I am a fundamental uh, change person. Like I think that the world has to fundamentally radically change in a revolutionary way. And so uh, when I, all of my, all of my kind of musings in terms of writing and the way that I make work is, is to sort of try to just exist as a thing in and of itself. And I'm not trying to, incorporate myself in some way into a capitalist sort of market system you know like the, there's i think one of the things about that question of like who do you imagine is the audience for your work is a lot about marketing it's a lot about this question of how do you what what demographic do we want to sort of target to sort of buy this thing you know and i just um fundamentally reject all of that now it, i think it means that i'm never going to make very money but that's fine you know um i i always joke that i think i've taken a vow i'm like a priest in that sense that i've taken a vow of um, of poverty not of celibacy luckily but of um of poverty um hi saban i think my boyfriend's watching speaking of not being celibate hi saban um definitely not celibacy but of poverty yeah and in worldly things i think that there's a as a a, a a giving up of worldly things. I mean, I think that what I'm doing is, it, you know, it's, it's somewhere in some kind of religious practice uh, for me. So yeah. Does that answer your question, Jules? I don't know if it does. No, no, I think it, it I mean, again, this might be my own biases, but I think there's something you said about the artist going beyond just the individual, because it seems like all we've gotten out of the artist being the individual is like certain terms being written and certain jobs being done. But I think there needs to be something to be said about them. Um, kind of more collective historical practice, which I think you kind of exercise in your work. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I think that, um, I think when I'm singing, I don't necessarily feel as if I am present. A lot of what the text I was presenting was about is, is, a, is a, a way of evacuating oneself, one's ego and allowing other spirits, other energies, the dead, to sort of, it's a strange thing to talk about. I really feel strange talking about it because I feel like some kind of West Coast touchy-feely person. I did live on the West Coast for a long time, but that's not where I'm coming from. Like, I really feel as if I want to be used for something, you know, greater than myself. And it is a collective thing. 
I do think that. I don't think that it's an, an, an individualistic thing. I don't think it's an ID politics thing. It's much bigger than that. Does someone else have a question? Yeah, it looks like Mary, and thank you, Jules, for that. And Mary, I'll unmute you. Oh, no, you're already unmuted. You're good. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Hi. Okay. Um, I'm Marie, and I'm a really big fan of yours. I have been for a while. I love just your music and your aesthetic and your artwork. I ordered your book, so I think you're amazing. And I was just wondering, do you have, was there like an opera that inspired you toward operatic singing, or was it more like just an artist in general? Or? No, um, when I was um, a child, maybe 13. So I, so the first time I heard opera singing, I was just sort of flipping through a radio that I had as a child, maybe I was eight, and I heard a tenor voice and I was like, that's an interesting sound. Hmm, I'm, this is intriguing to me. So I spent a lot of time listening to it. And then I saw Leontine Price, was it Leontine or Jesse? One of them on PBS, I think it was Leontine. She was singing Un Bel Diva Streamer from Madame Fly. Pardon my Italian, my voice teacher. When I work on Italian, I don't sing it in public, but I work on it and it's not very good. So pardon me for all of the Italian speakers out there. And um, so she's singing this Puccini aria from Madame Butterfly, the very famous aria from Madame Butterfly. And she's saying Summertime uh, from Porgy and Bess. And of course, uh, Porgy and Bess is an opera, not a musical, if, for those who don't know. The, and so she's saying it as it was first performed. And I was transfixed. Um, that was, I think, the moment when I was like, I, it, it became, it, so it's not a particular opera, but particular opera singers, Leontine Price, Jesse Norman, Marian Anderson, Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson's interesting too because of his political um, sort of activism along with the fantastic singing. It was, um, so yeah, it was, it was opera singers, these particular black opera singers that obsessed me and continue to. I mean, I listened to one of them every day of my life. Um, because why wouldn't you? It's a fantastic, glorious sound that they make. It's very uniquely Black. Um, Greg Tate, the wonderful columnist who, who wrote for the Village Voice, I love Greg Tate. He was also a part of um, the Black Rock Coalition. We were on a panel recently. And he's had this sort of whole thing of like, well, what is opera not Black music? I mean, like, that is, is it this criticism of Black people doing it? them just sort of like trying to sort of be a part of this European tradition. And I, I just turned to him and I said, well, have you heard Leontine Price sing? Yeah. Um, to me, that is the answer to that question. I mean, she is bringing every bit of Laurel, Mississippi uh, and that Southern kind of like accent dialect that she has to Strauss, Wagner, uh, Verity. Uh, it's all there. Um, it's just, and it's also just this heightened way of, I mean, I, I, I was saying before, this heightened way of, of, of kind of leaving your body in a way, creating this sort of supernatural sound. I'm just obsessed with it. I, it's an obsession. Like I just, um, when I saw these women kind of sort of standing there, leaving their bodies, it was just the most glorious sort of fixing thing that, you know, I think a lot of, I mean, my voice teacher talks about, uh, his name's Iris Siff. He talked about seeing Joan Sutherland in like maybe in 1961 when he was like a teenager or something at oh, the wow. Met and that sort of just being the end for him. I mean, I think that for some uh, homosexual men, queer men, gay, whatever you want to call us, um, I think there's something about operatic sopranos. I mean, and Wayne Kostamon has a whole book about it, Opera Homosexuality and the Mystery of Desire. You know that book? It's a fantastic book. Wayne Kostenbaum. Anyway, um, about this thing of, of, of gay people, homosexuals, and opera. Uh, he was talking about it sort of from the context of, of, of the sort of pre-Stonewall kind of identity, but I think that it, it I, I don't know what that's about. I don't know quite what it is, uh, but many, I think, countertenors, um, specifically your male sopranos, I think sing because of their love of the um, operatic soprano voice. I mean, in my Voice teacher's case, it was Collis and, and, Renard, and Renard Scotto. Those were his, these were the women who were like, you know, calling him to sing, you know? I mean, like, a lot of opera singers talk about this calling, like Leontine or Jesse talk about just sort of singing when they were three years old or something. And I think a lot of us queer people are called by various divas who speak to us. So does that answer your question? Yes, oh my God. I feel like I'm trying to keep in mind all the, Reference. What was the name of that book again that you mentioned? 
The Queen's Throat, Opera, Homosexuality, and the Mystery of Desire. Wayne Kostenbaum is the writer. But The Queen's Throat, if you just you type that into Google, it should come up, The Queen's Throat. It's a fantastic. Awesome. No, I think that's a brilliant answer. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for asking and thank you for being, I, I, I see that you comment often on my, uh, or like my Facebook posts or whatever. So I, I do, I do. Thank you. Cool, well, that's, that's right at time. And Em, as much as you're talking about transcending your body, I sure feel lucky that we're sharing the same air and earth right now. I mean, to have you as a channel, a conduit, a font of, uh, of just expression and artistic uh, everything, I, I sure feel thankful that you took the time with us and for everything that you're doing. Thank you. This wasn't quite the environment that I was planning. Uh, I planned a very different kind of thing that didn't quite work out technically, but so I apologize for that. But thank you so much, Nathan, for having me. And um, please come back for the screening of Deathlessness on November 17th, everyone who's watching. Uh, I'm excited for that to sort of be in the world. Um, it's been a thing I've been working on for a very long time. So um, I'm curious about <laughs> how it will live out there. Um, once it's released, you know, sort of into the, into the world. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we are, yeah, we are thrilled. And you guys probably all, you're here because I'm sure you follow him on Instagram, but Lamar underscore M Lamar, um, or underscore Lamar, um, Instagram, Facebook. Of course, you have a wonderful website and uh, we'll be posting a ton about it. But again, M, thank you so much, man. We just feel so lucky and uh, we'll keep talking. We will keep talking. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, guys. Everyone have a great night.